Okay, so now I'm going to show you how to do the actual predictive modeling, which is the culmination of project uh, three. And so uh, what I'll say is that I've taken a lot of effort to sort of write it out step by step in the project description file. And uh, this video is meant to supplement this. I'm going to show you physically how to do some of these steps and we're going to make a very simple version of the predictive of a predictive model but I want you to, to spend a little bit more time than what I'm going to do in this video to think about your thresholds and all of this kind of stuff as it mentions in the project description okay so the first thing I want to do is to create a new map set this is important because we're going to be making a bunch of maps interim maps and then final predictive model maps and we want to stay organized so I'm going to go back to my data tab um, I'm currently still in that test uh, map set that I made before and so I'm just going to uh, make a new map set and I'm going to call it predicted and the, ugh. actually what I'm going to call it this uh, originally the sites I queried out were I think uh, Nabataean Towers so I'm going to call this Nabataean I'm just going to put Nab for short Towers Predict if model okay just so I know what that, what the deal is right more descriptive is better uh, although then that comes sometimes with longer names so we want to keep the names relatively short but also include enough information so we know what the deal is so this map set is blank what I want to do actually is I want to move in my original queried out um, vector points files because you can't normally edit vector points files when they're in a different map set so we're going to need to query up some values uh, into these uh, eventually so I want to move them all into this map set it's also kind of nice to keep everything organized um, we sort of came at this project in a couple phases in project two we did some original querying but now we want to move them in for project three so what I'm going to do is go to file manage maps and uh, what I'll do is I'll copy them into this particular map set so actually before I run this I need to open up my uh, settings grass working environments map set access and make sure that I can look at all the other map sets that we've been making along the way we're going to need to pull in some of these maps but uh, you know we may not need all every single one of these but probably we're going to need a map in each one of them so I'm going to check them all at this moment uh, and here we are back at g.copy and we're going to go to the vector tab because I'm copying vector maps at this particular stage and uh, I got to remember when I did this uh, visibility yeah Nabataean towers are here and I, the way you do this you pull in you find the map that you want at the maps that you want you hit a comma and then you can type in whatever name you want for this so I'm just gonna just give it a slightly different um, suffix there in empty and towers predictive model and I'm gonna hit run and um, when that's done that's good so I can hit close to G copy. If I go to my layers tab, I can add in my Nabataean towers, right? So there they are. And while I'm in here, I'll just add in my uh, SRTM so we have a backdrop. And there we go. So there we have our, uh, let's zoom to, so there we have our predictive, uh, our, our training data set that we're going to use to create our predictive model. The next thing you have to do is to create a testing data set and um, ideally if you have a lot of these you could actually randomly sample some proportion of them to use to create the statistics that you're going to use to create your cutoffs or in our case because you know there happens to be a reasonable number of Nabataean towers but for some of your time periods it might be like five or ten sites and at that point um, if you leave too many out, you're really not going to have a robust enough signal to be able to come up with some reasonable cutoffs in your inductive model. So what I've suggested is you pick like the subsequent time period and the same kind of site. So what I'll do is I'll pick towers from the subsequent 
Roman period, and I'll do that uh, as I normally do, and I will I will do that in the attribute table. So I'm just going to add in my WHS sites, the full thing. Uh, again, that's the the full data set. It's in permanent. I'll right click and uh, put show attribute data. The table will come out. By the way, sometimes if you do that, it'll just run and run and run and run and run, and it will never pop the table up. At that point, just close Grass, restart it, and it should work. Um, it's probably a bug in this current version of Grass, but it seems to work if you just close and restart Grass again. So here's our table. We're going to do the same deal we did way back when, which is to build an SQL site, uh, query by clicking the SQL Builder. So select anything from WH8 sites where, and we'll just scroll down to our column Roman equals one. Remember, that's how we sell if it's a Roman site. It's either one or zero in the Roman column. And then to get the towers, we need to put our and, and we can go back up to uh, site type equals and we put our single quotes and in the middle TWR that's the code for power now I happen to have that all memorized you may have to go back and look at the list of um, you know site types the codes that are in the, the spreadsheet file you've downloaded back in project 2 and uh, we'll verify that this statement is valid and we'll hit apply and we've now selected all the Roman sites that are towers okay and we can right click on those and we can put extract selected features and we'll call this Roman Towers. Uh, let's call this the testing set. Okay. So now what we can do, I'll just remove the full data set and we have our Nabataean Towers, which is our training uh, data set. Uh, so I'm going to just make those uh, in, I don't know, red uh, like so. And then we have our Roman towers which are the uh, testing data set. And of course some of them are going to be the same it looks like here. But that's going to be okay for our purposes. So let's just zoom back out we can see it all. Those are our two uh, maps that we're going to use. Now, the Nabataean towers, what you're going to need to do is to go through and figure out what types of input data for your predictive model are going to be important. Visibility, probably going to be important for the towers. Distance to water, maybe not so much, right? So you have to decide of all the maps that we have made, that could be something that's important. The aspect could be important. Slope, I don't know. We'll have to do some querying, right? So what you'll want to do is to run through a whole bunch of the, you know, creating a new column in the tau and the, sorry, in the table for that. So I'm going to open up the attribute table and uh, what did I do? Oh, sorry. I picked the wrong thing. Uh, show attribute data <laughs> and remember this is our big table I can't remember what I've queried total visibility I queried over here um, but remember what you'll want to do is to add new columns for each variable here I'll add one for aspect and aspect will be added as a column and I'll add one for um, slope and we'll add that and we could do all the land uh, codes you know I'm sorry land um, form types that we did from our param scale we also have our new paleoclimate variables so I'll put one for precipitation because I think that's the one that I uh, interpolated so um, we can do that and we could add temperature and you know all the other things we need at least four to five of these to make an interesting model uh, you know but choose ones that you think are important um, dist water yeah I'm just gonna add that in there even though it may not be important let's just add it all in there and uh, then you'll have to go through and 
do your VWAT RAST on all of these things and that's um, update attributes at point locations here's our towers and then we just gotta step through and query in all of the maps like such picking the name of the column for each of those hitting run allowing it to go same deal for slope changing the column to slope hitting run uh, What's the next column? Precipitation. Here we'll pick our um, Trace 21K uh, AP at two kilo years for Nabataean. You'll pick the right time frame for your age of sites. Hit run. And the last one for me in this case is the distance to water. And we'll pick our um, uh, when did we do that in? Was it in terrain analysis? Or was it in LCA? Yeah, I think it was in LCA. Uh, walking costs from streams. And we'll hit run. Okay, so now we have a bunch of data put into our, uh, into our table. And, uh, what we'll want to do is to refresh the table and make sure that there's data in there. And we can do a couple of things now. We can run v.univer on each of these columns to come up with the cutoffs. We can also run the d.histvec column or whatever the name of that add-on is, which I don't actually currently have installed on this particular computer. So uh, I will show you um, an alternative way to get uh, a histogram out of here if you don't have that thing installed or um, if you don't want to install it as an add-on. Um, so just give me two seconds. I'm going to pause to get a couple things set up and then we will do that. Okay, so I just had to log into my <laughs> Google Drive because it logged me out last time. So now we're ready to show you how to make, uh, to export this information and bring it over to a spreadsheet. Um, in particular, we're going to use Google Sheets because it's really easy to make a histogram in Google Sheets. Um, easier than Excel, believe it or not. Um, so anyway, this is our, our data that we just uploaded for our training set of Nabataean Towers. That's what I'm using here. We can close that. Um, we can go over to the File menu and go down to where it says Export Database Table and it says Common Export Formats, db.out.ogr. And what we'll do here is just pick the vector file that we want to export the table from. So here's our Nabataean Towers predictive model. And uh, what we want to do on the next one is just to give it a file name somewhere. Um, I'm just going to put it uh, in my downloads. Why not? And I will call it uh, Nab Towers Training Set. Okay. And we'll hit save. And then uh, what we'll do is to go to my downloads folder and oh sorry we have to hit run <laughs> and there we go and then we go to my downloads folder and there's nab T towers training set it creates a folder and inside that is a csv because that's the default format there are other ones but th this is the one that you'll want to get it into a spreadsheet for, uh, format so that's there and I'm just going to pull a tab over from uh, my uh, browser and uh, just log into your Google Drive or just you can type sheets.google.com up here and it will just load in you know your Google Sheets interface and you want to create a brand, brand new blank uh, spreadsheet and what you want to do is to go to the file tab and then uh, click import and then go to the upload tab and you can drag and drop your uh, NAB Towers training set CSV there and it will upload. It will say replace spreadsheet, that's fine. Detect the separator type automatically, it will be fine. All this other stuff, just leave it the same. Hit import and uh, very briefly it will uh, replace your blank spreadsheet with the data from your table. I want to stress that now this is decoupled from your GIS, right? Any new updates are not going to be shown in this sheet. You would have to export again, re-import again. 
Um, I'm just, you know, if you want to save this in your Google Drive, give it the name NAB Towers. Oops. Training set, right? That's normally what I would call it, training set, um, or whatever, right? So all of this stuff at the beginning, this is the data that was already in there. We're really interested in the columns at the end over here. And um, I'm going to put myself on this side because I'll show you how to create the histogram. So select whichever column you want to create a histogram of. Then go to the top here where it says insert chart. It's this little icon. Tap on it. Um, it will, by default, I think it will make a column chart, which looks like a histogram, but it's not. It's just plotting every single row and the value in that row. That could be useful, but we want it to be statistical based on the frequency. So this little window pops up, or this little tab on the right pops up, and we have chart type. So we'll just scroll down to where we see this one under other histogram chart. And it will automatically create the histogram for total visibility. In this case, we can see it's probably a Poisson function. Most of them are really low over here. And remember, this is um, these values over here are, in this particular case, categorical values or uh, integer values. So, you know, we've got this kind of weird esoteric uh, <laughs> uh, x axis over here. And what we'll want to do is to um, create the bucket values as one. And that will get our, um, you know, axis basically to align with our input categorical values. And now you can see the patterns here. So I'll tell you what we're going to do with this in a minute, but let me just make a couple more. One for aspect next. Again, tap my input chart. Since I've already done one histogram, it's going to do it again. And we can go to customize histogram, and we can change our bucket size. In this particular case, uh, let's just do it in increments of 50. You can maybe do it in increments of 25 or so to get some finer variation, right? So uh, let's just continue on. I'm going to move these over. And now we'll make the one for slope, like so. And we're going to customize. We're going to change our bucket size. And slope, uh, probably we want to do increments pretty small, like 2 degrees. So that's pretty good there. And precipitation will be our next one and customize that and uh, let me just scroll over so I can see the values so a couple hundred so these are in millimeters so I'll do increments of 10 millimeters that makes some sense and then our final one distance to water and uh, we'll customize that again distance to water is in this is seconds of walking time so let's go ahead and try it. buckets of actually pretty big buckets. We can type in 100. And yeah, that's giving us a good level of detail. So the whole point is you want to make histograms and you want to pick a bucket size or bin size that will give us enough detail without being so crazily detailed that we can't intuit the patterns. And we can uh, look now visually at the spread of our data. Now you can also, either using VUnivare or a formula here in uh, Excel, so for example, we can type in, um, actually it's average, and then uh, highlight the whole column, which it wants to do by default, and it will calculate it. We can type in equal sign S dev, and again, it will, it's smart, Google Sheets is smart, it'll pick the right column that's above it, we could enter, and uh, we could even, um, yeah, we could even do, uh, for example, uh, let's add a, add a row at the bottom, and we could even do the median. So you can just type median and put the opening parentheses again. It will pick the right column as long as you're putting the formula directly below. And now we have the mean, standard deviation, and the median value. 
we could use that, just those statistical numbers, to uh, to to guide our uh, to guide our decisions, and we could also just do it graphically. Here's a little uh, shortcut. We can just highlight those. I'm hitting Control C for copy, but you can just copy, and you can highlight the other areas. These are the other columns that we want to calculate that for. And we can just paste the formula in there, and we can get the mean standard deviation uh, and median. We can just it just copies the formula. Um, I'll move my face so you can see the formulas up here, and it's smart so it will know the columns as long as the formula is right underneath. It will do it for you. So now you have all the statistics that you need. You have all of the plots that you uh, would want to have, and you have to decide where your cutoffs are going to be. So, in terms of visibility, it looks like a natural cutoff would be three. So we would want to make the cutoff be on that side, and we would not anything lower than three. That seems to be a, a reasonable cutoff. And if we look at our um, paste that here again. Uh, we look at our standard deviation and mean, uh, it's 1.46 and 1.58. So if you take the mean value and you add one standard deviation to the right, you get three. 1.5 plus 1.5 more or less, right? So our visual assessment and our statistical assessment in that case lines up. In terms of aspect, um, it looks like it might be slightly bimodal, but uh, maybe this 175 or so, between 150 and 175, is a, a reasonable peak here for, for an average value. And the spread is, you know, it's pretty big. It's not a, it's not a narrow peak here. It's kind of a, 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 a roundish, lowish peak. So if we look down below at, um, uh, which one is this, aspect, this, that's this column. If we look at it, we have our mean 171 plus or minus 88. So we can pick uh, aspects mostly facing uh, whatever direction that is. Remembering zero in this case is looking west. And so maybe the aspects are southish facing in this particular case, right? So we might want to put a value here or here, one standard deviation on either side. Seems about right. For slope, it looks like most of them are in less than about 10 degrees, although we might have a bimodal distribution here where you get another spike around 17 or 18 degrees. But I think we'd probably be okay if we chose anything less than about 10 degrees slope. And then if we look at precipitation, we have, uh, you know, it may not be meaningful, but we have a, a you know, sort of a curve here with a spike over here. So this one is kind of all over the place. And if it were me making the choice, I'd say this doesn't have much meaning for the location of these particular sites, so I won't use it. And if I'm looking at uh, distance to water, I'm seeing the same thing, a big spread with a spike at about, uh, you know, looks like 650 or so. Um, but we would actually be losing quite a few sites if we tried to do any kind of cutoff in terms of distance to water. So in this particular case, um, I might go ahead and make my predictive model with just these three, the visibility, the slope, and the aspect. And maybe I should have done also landform or something like that to increase um, the, the quality of my uh, output predictive model. So you should be a little bit more careful looking at these values. You should write down your cutoffs. You should write down why you chose your cutoffs. But I'm just going to kind of wing it and because uh, I'm trying to do this relatively quick. So what I want to do is to open up my map calculator. And again, we're going to use the, the, the real map calculator. And I'm going to go start making uh, some binary maps using my cutoffs over here. So the first thing I'm going to do is to load in a Boolean statement. Uh, you can type it in or you can just uh, get it like so. And then we're going to load in our total visibility map from our visibility uh, total view shed. Yeah, there it is. And um, what we're going to do is to 
do a Boolean statement here. If total view shed is less than or equal to three, comma, make the map one, otherwise make it zero. So we're just doing a binary map over here. And we're gonna call this visibility binary. I'm gonna hit run. Uh, what did I do? Oh, there's an extra comma right there, sorry. Uh, and then we're gonna hit run and it will make the map and it will look like this. And if we load in our legend for this, we will see it's zero and one, right? Zero is above our threshold, one is below our threshold, the areas that we want to include. So the areas in yellow will be included when we create our predictive model and the areas in zero will be excluded or discounted when we create our final map. So now what we want to do is to basically go ahead and uh, create several more of these. Um, a simple thing to do is just to delete that first part of the Boolean statement, load in your next map, which will be aspect. So I'll go to train analysis aspect. And here, what I need to do is to have an interior cutoff. So what I'll start with is a uh, greater than or equal to, and uh, I think we'll pick 75 as our cutoff there, make one. And uh, right now what it would do is to make everything greater than or equal to 75 one, but we need to do an infix here. We need to put a, a, a right side cap on this. So here we're gonna use our um, and symbol here. If it's greater than or equal to 75, and if slope, we'll pick it again. Actually, what we wanna do is to put and if aspect is greater than and equal to 75, and aspect, <laughs> pick it again, and aspect is less than or equal to, and we'll pick a right side cutoff of, let's say 250, and again, I'm doing this fast and loose, then make it one, otherwise make it zero. So you see the and helps us get an infix over here. We'll hit run. Oh, we have to give it a new name. Sorry, we'll give this aspect binary and we'll hit run. And here we have our aspect. Anything in yellow again is gonna be included. Anything in purple is not. And again, we chose values in the middle of our histogram over here. And uh, here's our slope map over here. And it looks like we just want values less than 10. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, I am going to pick our uh, if statement again, and now I will load in my terrain analysis slope, and we can do less than equal to 10 degrees slope, and there is slope here, and I will hit run. Now, I mentioned the precipitation, looks like it's kind of all over the place. And uh, I also mentioned that the distribution of water is kind of all over the place. Well, um, I'm just going to use the distance to water uh, as an example of how to exclude the middle and include the ends. Um, ideally, you will do this meaningfully. You will have a meaningful pattern of bimodal or something like that um, that you'll want to include. What I'll do is I'll include values uh, to the left and to the right of two interior cutoffs. So I'll load in my if statement again, making sure there's no extraneous com comments in here. And what I will do is I will go down to my LCA and here I have walking costs from streams. And what I will do is I will now pick a less than and equal to um, 650. So that's going to include everything from 650 to zero. And then I will use or, which is going to exclude anything in the middle, and I'll say greater than 1150. Or, then we'll pick our walking maps again, 
is greater than or equal to 1150. So that's going to get everything from 750 to 0 and everything from 1150 to infinity. But it's going to exclude what's in the middle. And the important difference here is the or rather than the and. And here we're going to have uh, this stream binary. And we'll hit run. And then there's our binary map for that. So it picks just that little window on either side, close to the streams and then far from the streams. You know, that's not a real pattern from what I'm seeing here, but I'm just doing it to be instructional for you. So now we have finished all of our binary maps. We have a whole bunch of them in here. And we'll just load those. Uh, we'll just sort of pop through them so you can see how they all kind of look. Right, And now what we're going to need to do is to combine all of those to find our final probabilistic predictive model. And the way we're going to do that is to create a new formula in the wrap, master map calculator. And uh, we'll just make sure we blank everything out. And all we're going to do is create a weighted average. There are more sophisticated ways to do this, but this is the simplest way to, to take a bunch of binary maps and combine them and get some sort of probabilistic output. So what we'll need to do is to add them together and then divide by the total number to get the average. Um, alternatively, we could use a function of uh, mean or average, where is it here, median, min, mode, one of those functions in there for the mean value if we wanted to. But I'll show you the old school way because we'll also maybe want to weight some of these a little higher. And it's easier to do that if you type it out like so. So what we'll do is we'll, op we'll create some parentheses like so because we want to do our addition inside the parentheses. And then we will divide uh, outside the parentheses by the total number. And uh, initially, we made uh, one. I made one, two, three, four. You may make more of these, right? So our division will be by four. And inside the parentheses, we're just going to want to put those in, put a uh, plus symbol either by clicking there or typing on your keyboard, and then adding the next one and a plus symbol, and then adding the next one and add a plus symbol, and then adding the last one there. So now we have all four of our maps. They're added together, and then they're going to be divided by 4. And importantly, what you want to do is to put 4.0. Otherwise, because these are integer, it will keep that integer, and you will not have gradations between 0 and 1. You'll have 0 and 1. <laughs> um, I'll show you first. I won't put the point, and uh, we'll call this uh, nav towers prid. Uh, predictive model v1 because we'll make a couple versions here. We'll hit run. And it will still look like a binary map with just 0 and 1. But we don't want that. We want it to have some gradations. So we'll put the point 0. And now that will automatically create output as floating point or decimal values. So I'm going to overwrite my v1 and hit run. And now we're going to have a more interesting, more uh, variable map over here. So let me just put that um, in the raster uh, legend and click OK. And so now we see we have values between 0 and 1. The values of 1 are highly predicted by this predictive model. The values of 0 are not predicted by this. And if we put our... Uh, testing set from Roman Towers over the very top, uh, we can then figure out whether or not these uh, sites were predicted by our predictive model. So to do that, let's open up the uh, attribute table. Let's uh, go to Manage Tables, add a new column, uh, print model. I'm just going to put V1 because maybe I'll need to make a second version if this one doesn't predict it very well. Make it double because it's a decimal, and hit Add, like so. And uh, you'll notice, I'll just make this a little bigger so we can see. When I go over here and hit Refresh, we have our new column. And then, of course, our old friend, um, 
where it says update attributes from raster maps v what rast and we got our roman towers testing set and we're going to pull the values from our predictive model uh, v1 right here and we'll pull the name of our column which is predictive model and we'll hit run and here we go let's refresh and look at our values 0 0.5 0 0.75 yeah 1, 0 0.5, 0.25, etc. Let's go ahead and just grab some real quick uh, statistics for uh, for the for the columns VDB Univer, and we'll pull statistics for that particular column here, and uh, we'll just get the extended statistics and hit run. And what do we got? We got uh, the average prediction is 0.69 and our standard deviation is 0.22. So 0 0.69 plus 0.22, it's on the upper end, but it's not that great, and probably because I included the precipitation in that predictive model, uh, it's lost some predictive power. So what we might want to do is to figure out, hey, maybe if I weight heavily more one or more of these factors, the model might get better. So let us weight more heavily the aspect and the slope. So I will surround aspect by parentheses and inside that parentheses I will multiply this by 2. So we're going to count that twice in the model. And then we'll do the same thing with slope. I will surround the slope map name with parentheses. I will go in there put a multiplication by 2. So effectively we've added those maps each twice. So we have two additional maps in our formula. We need to now divide by 6.0. I'm going to call this V2 and we'll hit run. And there's our V2 map over here. So back in our testing set we need to add a new column and we'll call this pred model v2 and we'll add it in there and again it's still double uh, as a double for floats and uh, we'll find our uh, where's our v what rest somewhere in the background uh, over here sorry did I close it no there it is v what rest and we will uh, pick our uh, new v2 model which should be in here um, and if it isn't we will pick our testing set and we'll have to refresh that probably but I'll just hit V2 actually we'll delete that and did it it made it didn't it yeah I'll just close VWAT RAS and open it again. Uh, update attributes VWAT RAST. And we're going to do our Roman Towers testing and we'll query in. There it is, our V2. And we'll pull in our next new column, which is V2 over here. And we'll hit run. And we'll just make sure that our data was loaded in. We'll hit refresh. There's our new column over here, and we'll find our VDB Univer. And again, we're going to have to open that up again. Uh, reports and statistics, VDB Univer. Pull our Roman testing set and go down to the bottom, predictive model V2, and hit run. And now we're going to see a mean of 0.66 and a standard deviation of 0.26. So actually, our model got a little bit worse in this particular case. So you'll see what you'll have to do is to go back and forth and experiment with weighting these in different ways. Maybe slope was not as important. Maybe distance to streams are more important. Uh, but you'll, what you'll want to do is to try and get your model to have the highest mean value and the smallest standard deviation possible. And you might have to go through this a couple different times. Um, 
And also, it may just be that your training and testing data sets are using different locational uh, variables, so it may be that your model's just not very good for the particular way that we're testing it, which is why it would be better if you had a whole bunch of uh, input points to train your data with that you would segment out some of those and keep them as an internal testing set um, in order to probably get a more valid statistical test of it. But basically, that is the process of creating predictive models. The more inputs you have, the more nuanced the model is, but also the more difficult it's going to be to figure out which one of those factors is driving the, the best uh, predictive capacity for your particular model. And again, we're doing this as Boolean uh, binary input. You could have a more nuanced set of inputs where you have uh, categories like one, two, three, four, where one is the most and four is the least. Uh, and then you would set up your, your final uh, equation in a slightly different way and the values would be different, but it would also be a predictive model that would give you probabilities across the landscape. So this model, uh, this video has gone on quite long. I'm going to end it for here and hopefully following along also with the description of project three, you'll be able to figure, figure this out pretty well.